Baldur's Gate Woke Edition, bringing the good, the bad, and the ugly of modern day video game design and development to your timeless classic franchise. Welcome to Yold Entertainment, my name is Alex, and it is my duty, my mission, my purpose in life to help you decide whether that game that you have been thumbing for so long is indeed the right game for you or not. And also welcome to our next stop on our road to Baldur's Gate 3. This time we'll be taking on Siege of Dragonspear, the 2016 expansion to the 2013 Enhanced Edition of the 1998 original game. Yes, I think I got that right. So if you believe the hardcore fan community of naysayers on the internet, Siege of Dragonspear is little more than an interactive identity politics pamphlet, all hell-bent on forcing you to accept the progressive vision of the new world, written by a crazed activist with very little regard for the paying customer's opinion or the market at large. If you're all about diversity, inclusion, and representation though, Siege of Dragonspear is nothing short of a masterpiece that seamlessly breathes modern day social values into your favorite classic franchise while retaining its glorious essence. While there seems to be no middle ground to be walked between these two camps, the truth, as it is often the case, is somewhere in between. And it is so for us, because we use a system of categories that we think is relevant to the game at hand. The game at hand this time is Siege of Dragonspear, a Dungeons & Dragons computer role-playing game, and when it comes to those, character creation and character progression are up first. Everything I said about Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition is still true of Siege of Dragonspear. If you didn't watch our video on Baldur's Gate, I'll give you the basics. You have a robust array of options, like choosing your genre, your race, your class, your subclass, weapon proficiencies, and in some cases, initial spells or skills, and that's much more than most other games have to offer. Unfortunately, because this game has to adhere to the second edition advanced Dungeons & Dragons rule set, you have very little input on your character's leveling. This time though there's a neat little treat to get you hyped. Immediately after you're done spanking the big bad guy's butt in Baldur's Gate, you're introduced to Siege of Dragonspear's opening cutscene. And shortly after, you find yourself, along with those companions you chose to bring with you to the final confrontation with Savarok, taking on a mission to flush out Savarok's evil underling. The transition from Baldur's Gate to Siege of Dragonspear is seamless. Your name, class, race, items, your current status and reputations with your other companions, including your romantic advances if any, are all acknowledged and preserved in Siege of Dragonspear, and that alone elevates the experience a little bit above the original game. Gameplay. So if you watched our last video, you might have gathered that I wasn't head over heels with the gameplay in Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition. It had many great moments and an epic final stretch, but also plenty of filler moments that made the game feel longer than it needed to be. Siege of Dragonspear, though, offers a condensed, lean experience that includes everything that was great about the original game and leaves out everything that wasn't. Gone are the long, bland locations with the repetitive combat, stark loot, and little to do. This time around, locations are littered with landmarks, NPCs with quests for you to do, interesting loot, and diverse and frequent combat encounters. There's purpose behind everything you do, and looking behind every nook and cranny generally reveals something interesting, or useful, or both. I've mentioned before in this channel that I am a sucker for episodes in which you have to defend your stronghold under desperate circumstances, and also for those epic final moments in which you take the battle to the baddies and lay siege on their stronghold. Well, I'm happy to report that Siege of Dragonspear has both of these, and they're among the most epic that I've played. At one point in the game you have to defend your war camp against waves of invaders and seemingly overwhelming odds. This is made even more interesting by the fact that, throughout the game, you meet several faction leaders for whom you can perform certain tasks to gain their favor. So when your camp is attacked, those factions you helped will come to your aid. Your defense of your war camp is made even more interesting due to the fact that you may even choose which factions you want to lend a hand against each wave of invaders. This reminded me of the final stretch of Dragon Age Origins and that's always a good thing. The final stretch of the game starts with the very Siege of Dragonspear, and that comes packed with a giant battle between two armies, a duel to end things honorably, and a final push that takes place in a very cool setting, about which I won't be giving you any further details to save you the spoilers. Siege of Dragonspear kicks off with a mission to kill Corlas, one of Savarok's remaining top lieutenants, this location alone is quite the sampler of what you can expect from the rest of the game. A busy location filled with loot, challenging and exciting battles, NPCs with a bunch of things for you to do, and a boss battle that'll challenge your tactical skills and mindset like the best of them in the modern day RPG landscape. And in truth, it rarely gets boring from then on out. Siege of Dragonspear is an impressive example of how far game design has come in the last 20 years. The game uses the Infinity Engine, 
the same engine that was used in the original game. So Siege of Dragonspear looks and feels like the original Baldur's Gate in terms of graphics, mechanics and lore. But gameplay-wise is an experience comparable to what the very best modern-day games in the genre have to offer. Beamdog making Siege of Dragonspear with the Infinity Engine is a bit like Michael Schumacher winning a Formula 1 championship driving a Benetton. Yes, both of these things happened, and yes, they were both pretty freaking impressive. Story and Lore So I walked into Siege of Dragonspear completely ignorant of the controversy surrounding the story and the writing. But just as I was about to finish the game, I couldn't help but feel the writers had written themselves into a corner by letting their social activism drip into the story. Men will never give a lady her due. If you desire something, I recommend taking it first and asking permission later, if you really must ask permission at all. Allow me to elaborate further on this. So the original Baldur's Gate was a walking bag of classic Dungeons & Dragons cliches and tropes, but it had enough heart to keep you engaged and interested the whole way through, or at least most of the way. At first, the story in Siege of Dragonspear didn't seem to be too different. Let me give you the basics. The word has gotten around that you're a badass, so everyone agrees that you're the one to turn to to stem the tide of evil. This time the villain is a warrior known as Kalar Argent, an Asimar woman who's been wreaking havoc all along the Sword Coast, and everyone is soiling their draws because she's marching towards Baldur's Gate, leaving a trail of death and destruction in her wake. So every major city around the Sword Coast chips in and sends you along with the Order of the Flaming Fist to put an end to Kalar Argent's plans. So after a huge second act that stretches over many chapters, filled with MacGuffin chases, barely related quests, clashes with Kalar's army every now and then, and recovering a fort that has high tactical value, but is never used again, you learn that part of the world sees Kalar Argent as the good one of the lot. And there's the downside. The game desperately tried to make the case that there's more than meets the eye to Kalar Argent and her plan. The writers tried to paint her as a character who walks a path of shades of grey between good and evil. You know nothing of me, godling. You have no idea of the compromises I've made, the people I lost to stand here today. If you did, you would not be so quick to condemn me. Only they couldn't do that because they wrote themselves into a corner. They wanted Kalar Argent to be as important as the protagonist. But they couldn't do that because that spot was already taken by the player's character. So they made her the antagonist. But they didn't want to make her a villain. But the plot needed her to do bad stuff to bring the entire Sword Coast together under one banner to face her. So the bad stuff had to be cooked up by someone else. Someone in Baldur's Gate paid for the Ballspawn's blood? Why? Heffernan, what can this mean? In the interest of sparing you major spoilers and sparing myself the pain of diving deeper into the controversy, I'll just say that these self-imposed checkboxes regarding the characters resulted in huge contrivances and a bloated and unnecessarily convoluted behemoth of a story. What you got was a main antagonist that failed at being complex, because she needed not to be the villain. A villain that is so evil that he comes off as some mustache twirling cartoon of a bad guy, whose motivations are shallow and simplistic, and a protagonist who is robbed of his heroic role in the story. One thing I loved about Greedfall is that, though you don't have that many dialogue options, you always seem to have one that 100% represents what you would say in your character's place in every given situation. And the game can afford to provide you with reasonable dialogue options because the story is pushed forward by the characters and not the plot. So in Greedfall you don't have to say what needs to be said because the plot demands it. Siege of Dragonspear is the very opposite of this. There are many possible outcomes in the game, but the dialogue lines that you can choose from in critical situations feel like the convenient thing to say to drive forward the plot, and they seldom feel like something that you would say in your character's place. There is a passage in which you are given the chance to parlay with Kylar Argent about reaching a peaceful solution. She offers to call off her armies if you come with her to the Nine Hells. The game sells this moment as a critical plot point in which you must make a weighty decision, but regardless of which choice you make, there's only one possible outcome and no way to circumvent the final battle. When next you see my banner, it will be at the head of the army that marches on you. There's also a hooded character who seems to know more than he's letting on. He turns out to be an important character you'll meet later in Baldur's Gate 2. But he's nothing more than an annoying interruption who pops up every now and then to say stuff, mysterious stuff, that has nothing to do with your main quest or anything else really. Your tenuous connection to the essence within you has been rewoven and reinforced, if not necessarily refined. 
The writers in Shadowrun Hong Kong and Greedfall, for example, nailed the mystery aspect of the story because it was relevant to your purpose in the game. The mystery was revealed to you at the right pace, and it felt like the product of you taking the effort to look into it. Here, the hooded figure appears randomly, he says nothing that you can tie into the main mission, and his dialogue boils down to, I'm not going to tell you anything else because I'm the mysterious hooded figure. I'm supposed to be all mysterious and stuff. This hooded figure has an evil plan that, story-wise, is meant to serve as an explanation of how you got to the dungeon where you begin the game in Baldur's Gate 2. The problem with this is that his plan is just way too bloated and unnecessarily convoluted. Another aspect of the writing at which I feel Dragon Siege fails is the humor. That's what me said, with shorter words. Humor was a big part of the fun in the original Baldur's Gate. It was very distinctive, I'd even say uniquely Baldur's Gatian. There are still a few decent moments here and there, but most of the times it just feels too milquetoast and predictable. On top of that, there are also some serious continuity errors here. Siege of Dragonspear is meant to take place between Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2, but some of your decisions and actions in Siege of Dragonspear may result in serious inconsistencies in Baldur's Gate 2. For example, Khalid may die defending Bridgefort in Siege of Dragonspear, and even if that happens, he's still found dead in the dungeon in the first chapter in Baldur's Gate 2. Also, Emoin is beginning to feel a little bit like Duke from The Hangover, the guy who always disappears at the beginning of the movies. I don't think I need to go into any further detail about the story and its many controversies. The writers just dropped the ball hard with Siege of Dragonspear, companions lore-wise. So unfortunately, everything that's wrong about the writing drips into your companions lore-wise. While the first game wasn't exactly the paragon of good companions, the enhanced edition injected new life into the original deal by adding some cool and interesting characters, some of which were even decent little romantic interests like Nira. This time even Nira is reduced to an annoying nutjob who's obsessed with silencing Adoid's voice, her friend from the original Baldur's Gate who's now been turned into an irritating inner voice. This issue takes up almost the entirety of her dialogue lines. Totally. You have no idea what it's like having someone interrupt you constantly. The man never shuts up. Overall, a step down from the original. Companions gameplay-wise. This time around there are 15 characters, half as many as they were in Baldur's Gate. The game does not suffer from any shortage of tactical possibilities though. The array of classes, races, alignments and worlds on offer is still remarkable. Four new characters were introduced this time. I only had the chance to bring Corwin into the party. She's an archer who can also off-tech and is capable of doing some modest DPS with the proper gear. She's a very good example of the versatility of your companions in both Baldur's Gate and Siege of Dragonspear. I played a good character, but I think evil players are going to have a hard time with the new companions as none of the new characters are evil. Still, solid stuff here. Secondary mechanics. For the love of all that's holy, this is a new game released in the year 2016. Maybe I'm just being ignorant here, but I can't fathom why you still have the exact same dated inventory mechanics and the same pre-cambric two-click disarming trap and lock picking system. I won't bore you, or myself, retelling my take on the secondary mechanics of Baldur's Gate. You may go check my review on the original game if you wish. I'll leave the link in the description section down below. There is at least one thing that has been greatly enhanced and that was much needed, and that's the labeling and the navigation in the map of Baldur's Gate. So secondary mechanics might be marginally better, but when you take into account that this is a game that they built from the ground up in the year 2016, there's really no excuse for this. And yes, there's still issues with items not being able to stack. Voice acting. Who goes there? Ah, uh, sorry. <laughs> a little drink yesterday evening turned into a lot of drinks early this morning. Uh... Things at camp were dull, dull, dull. Corporal Duncan absolutely refused to let me out of it. The writing in Siege of Dragon Spear is so bad that it drags other aspects of the game down into the hellhole along with it. While most of the original characters are still solid, and many of the new ones are also excellent and adequately consistent with a medieval fantasy vibe, some others are the product of some of the issues affecting this game. So while you and I may agree that a strong character may be strong because he or she has a strong voice in the story, strong convictions, has a solid character arc, or because he or she is smart or resourceful, that's not the way an activist writer sees it. An activist writer wanting to portray a strong female character has to make her physically strong, lest the subtleness be lost in the dumb idiotic audience. They must be clad in plate, the impositions of command, and speak with coarse voices. 
and because according to them throughout history there have not been enough strong women in video games, but too many weak princesses obsessed with a male rescuer, we must now completely eradicate the latter and litter our games with strong women. And because the concept of a strong female character is the plate-clad female soldier with a raspy voice, we get a plethora of characters we can't even tell apart, because they're all soldiers that speak with coarse voices and wear a plate, and of course the voices to go with them. What a bunch of pathetic babies! I've never seen a worse lot in my entire career! Oh, and because you may be too stupid to tell bad guys apart, they need to have distinctively villainous voices. Those who still live will be baptized in the blood of those sacrificed in your name. So the result is a mixed bag that goes from very good, to decent, to cliche, to on the nose because it's part of the message. Siege of Dragonspear sadly sinks into mech depths in this category. Music. Once again, they hit the nail in the head with an atomic hammer. This soundtrack and the one from the original Baldur's Gate were composed almost 20 years apart, and this one is still 100% on point. I could almost say that the epicness here is too damn high. Even when it takes the backseat, the music here consistently delivers all the immersion, badassery, and epicness D&D games are known for. This one may very well be one of my favorite D&D soundtracks, and that, my friends, is saying a lot. Sound effects and mix. Oh, so it was not the Infinity Engine. Well, I don't know what it was, but this time around things have been significantly improved. Don't get too excited though, it's still not great. But this time around the sounds feel much roomier and better mixed, even if many of the sounds effects aren't great. Many spells and weapon hits still sound similar, and some of them are even absent. I still needed to look at the combat log from time to time to be able to tell what was going on, but this time around the oomph is there, and with much fewer volume and clipping issues. Graphics. Again, when it comes to most things, it's not the bow and the arrow, it's the archer. Siege of Dragonspear was made with the same engine as Baldur's Gate, and it is understandable that they decided to recycle weapon and item models, and we've established already that those weren't great in Baldur's Gate, and they continue not to be great here of course, but there's a vast, and I do mean vast improvement in the locations. Not only do they feel tighter and leaner gameplay-wise, they're also more interesting and consistent as part of the art package. Forests feel lush or corrupt depending on the case. Dungeons and caves have greater detail, and there's an adequate adventure feeling to them. Enemies are also much more diverse and interesting than in the original game. And all of these improvements are seamless, as you never feel like the vibe of the original game is ever lost. So kudos to Beamdog for pulling this off. Performance and stability. The game runs smoothly on any current, and not so current gen gaming PC. I never got a single crash, I didn't run into any annoying bugs, although there are a few reports around the internet of this or that character or this or that item not appearing where it should, but not in my experience, and I have to call it as I see it. Other considerations and final thoughts. Siege of Dragonspear offers a surprisingly tight gameplay experience, though my experiences with games like Pillars of Eternity 2 and Pathfinder Kingmaker are still fresh in my mind. This game is at least every bit as challenging and exciting as those two, if not more. This is tremendously remarkable if you consider that the Infinity Engine has been around for more than 20 years. When it comes to RPGs though, I expect the story to carry the weight of the experience. Unfortunately, Siege of Dragonspear fails spectacularly in this regard. The story is not great to begin with, but on top of that, at least one of the writers decided to die on the hill of the social points she wanted to get across, and that ultimately buried the story beyond redemption. I should say that I do not expect to sell you the way I feel about the story as the tape measure for this or any other game. The whole purpose of this channel is to help you decide whether the game being reviewed is for you or not. If you think that video games should be part of the entertainment armada who has decided it is their responsibility to usher in a new world that's more welcoming to groups that have been historically sidelined, and if you think the right way to do so is by putting more stones on one side of the balance than are needed to make it even, because that's how you make up for past inequalities, and that this must be done in video games as well as in movies and TV shows, 
There is no way you and I will ever agree for sure, but maybe this review might have helped you decide that this game is indeed the right game for you, and we'd be happy all the same if that has been the case. And well, that's all I have for you today. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, thank you for watching all the way up until now. If you like what you're seeing in this channel, please consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell to avoid the usual YouTube shenanigans. Share the video, but most importantly, never stop gaming, but don't let gaming get in the way of your hopes and dreams. Bye, everyone.